And, uh, <clears throat> let me just say first off that uh, I'll give you the background on Carlos and what's really going on as quickly as I can uh, rather than go into details. Uh, the major problem with Cal OSHA is that we don't have enough compliance officers. And, th and that is compared to a lot of other states. We have, there are 22, oh, let's go back. Okay, Fed OSHA gave 22 states the right to form OSHA programs. California was one of them. In the beginning, under the first Jerry Brown administration, we were probably the model program. We had a very strong program with six doctors, I was one of them, and we had, uh, in, in terms of the ratio of compliance officers or investigators, we had one of the best in the country. Well, all of that started diminishing and diminishing in terms of effectiveness and, 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 and investigatory powers. <clears throat> At present, it went, we now have one investigator per 90,000 workers. Now, required by the International Labor Organi Organization, their requirement was one per 10,000. Uh, if you look at the Oregon program, the Washington program, the British Columbia program, we pale by comparison. We are about 10% of what they are in terms of that ratio of investigators to workers. It's a weak program to begin with. And then what happened was, it's a program that's heavily influenced by the political appointees that come from Sacramento. So at one point they actually abolished Cal OSHA under Duke Machen when he got in, and then there was a proposition passed, Prop 97, which put it back in business. So for two years I was doing something else, and then uh, I went back to work for Cal OSHA. I worked there for 28 years total. Uh, and. Uh, and saw a lot of investigation. So let's look at Richmond. Let's get on to, to that because I think that is a model, or, or rather a, a, a portrait of what, of the dysfunction of Cal OSHA, of what happened, what, what is going on there. You know, it's a shock. Cal OSHA was called out, there's a, oh, there's a district office called the Profit, Process Safety Management District Office. And they, they oversee some of the most dangerous industry in California that have very complex uh, processes, production processes. And so they oversees all, oversee all of the refineries in California. And Carla Fritz is in, in the in Northern California District Office. She was called out to investigate a fire at the Richmond, Chevron Richmond Refinery back in November of 2011. That was just nine months before this horrific, catastrophic uh, event that occurred here in Richmond, where 15,000 people, local residents, went to the uh, emergency rooms, were severely affected uh, with acute reactions, and I'll get into that in a minute, because the uh, exposures go far beyond the acute reactions in terms of future health effects. But in addition, there were 20 workers in that vicinity. Some of them were with a subcontractor, and some of them were Chevron employees. Oh, so what happened was, I I'll go into the details in one minute. I just want to jump back again. I should stay with what happened when, during that first investigation, nine months earlier, they were called out for a fire mind you, and the, the investigator went out, checked it, the workers there, United Steel Workers, and the senior most one of them, told her that those pipes are dangerous. In fact, most of the pipes out there are outdated and they're at high risk for rupturing. So this is the information she was giving from the workers. Now in the California Labor Code, the investigator is supposed to not only listen to the workers, that's supposed to be the most important part of her investigation, in this case a woman. And instead, the way they handled it was, I'll, I'll sum it up, I can give you a lot of details of what was overlooked, but what, instead what was done by the process safety manager is, in this case, you know, supervising Carla Fritz, was to say, let's look at the paperwork, let's look at what Chevron says they're going to do, they looked at it and they said, that's fine, Chevron took care of it, and that was as far as they went. Unbelievable. So then what happened was, uh, 
the, the months went by, and then this big event occurred in August of, of this year, right? And uh, I, I'll try to give you a quick outline. Some of that has been in the Chronicle. In fact, I've spoken at length with that reporter, Mr. Vanderbecken, and he did a very thorough job. He's been aware of all the refinery fires and incidents in this state for many years. And in fact, Chevron, other Chevron plants, including this one, have had three major events in the last year and a half, besides this great event here in Richmond in August. I, excuse me, yeah, August 7. So what happened was, uh, it's hard to paint the picture because it's so dramatic, but there was a leak in this crude oil processing. And the leak occurred, and then they said, well, we'll keep the unit running. So they never shut it down, and they could shut it down very fast, and the leak grew. And then it turned into a, a, a serious leak with, of gases. The fire engine came out, it's a big diesel engine. They, they have a fire department on, on site at the Chevron refinery. They came out and started pouring a lot of water on this very hot surface. So the steam came up with the escaping gases and it was like a white cloud. The problem was that the diesel truck kept running. So the workers are there, they see the situation and they just take off. It was like a miracle. Within seconds, uh, right before the explosion, the leak went on for two hours. They did, as they say, they didn't shut it down. Then what happens is, the explosion occurs. Nobody, it's a miracle nobody got killed. And uh, after that, most of you know this story. It went up like 5,000 to 7,000 feet high, spread over the entire community. And in case you're wondering, well, Chevron must have had the information on this. After all, they have these leaks all the time. They must have monitors. They don't. They don't have monitors at the plant boundary. They don't know what's going out into the community. They don't have monitors in their own work site. You know, I, I mean, it's just shocking. Well, in, Cal, in the Cal OSHA, in the Cal OSHA uh, labor code, that, the labor code governs Cal OSHA, it's the mandate. It is an excellent code. And part of it requires what's called an injury and illness prevention program. In every work site, the, the local cleaning uh, stores have to have, et what's cetera. What's injury? an Injury and Illness Prevention Program, IIPP. <clears throat> so the Chevron Refinery, of course, had one. Their program said that they had to remove pipe if it was more than 50% eroded. Now, it's very easy to check pipe. They do it with ultrasound. It's cheap, they can do it very fast, and no problem. Well, apparently they knew that that pipe was over 50% eroded, and in fact, when they checked the pipe, and this was not done by Cal OSHA, it was done by the United States Chemical Safety Board, a federal agency. They found that it had been eroded 90%. It was down to less than one sixteenth of an inch left of that pipe. Now, the <coughs> Chevron management was questioned on that. In fact, they responded. They said, yes, we knew we had a, a new kind of oil, low-grade oil, called high sulfur oil. Now, that's, that, that grade oil has to be superheated in order to remain liquid. So they've got the high heat, they've got the superheated oil, and the pipe they had was 40 years old. Now that pipe has very low amounts of silicon. Silicon is inert. It doesn't rust or erode so fast, but they didn't replace that pipe. So that's the background, and uh, it's really shocking. I mean, the criminal act should be taken by Kalosh and can be taken, but nothing was done. So then, uh, the, in, as part of Beck, Van der Becker's interviews, he interviews the chief of Cal OSHA. Am I going too long? No. He interviews the, key, the chief of Cal OSHA, Ellen Y. Dust, who, who I worked with in the first Brown administration, a lawyer. And she is, uh, you know, has been pro worker health and safety for a long time. She is appointed as chief. So she is asked by Van der Becker and another, uh, when will your report be out? I couldn't believe the answer. She says in February of 2013. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how open Cal OSHA was. In other words, they're stonewalling it until February of 2013. So she's head of Cal OSHA. She is the chief of Cal, they're called chiefs. One time I was called the chief, which is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, I mean, she's top management, you know. And uh, 
So she doesn't say anything. She just, you know, no information. So Vanderbeck goes to another way of obtaining the information called the Public Records Act, Re excuse me, Public Records Act. And under the law, they had to give her the previous inspections of Cal Ocean. It was required. So he got them. The, there was a problem in that they, had, they redacted the names of all of the United Steelworkers that worked there and gave previous information. So he couldn't interview them. He didn't know who they were. But at the same time, he got a lot of information out of that Public Records Act, like the previous inspections and other inspections uh, of Chevron and, and other oil refineries that have had fires and, and, uh, and explosive events. Uh, so that's sort of you know a, a thumbnail description of what uh, of what uh, uh, happened at that refinery. A pre really totally preventable, and, and really an outrage in terms of uh, of corporate responsibility. Uh, and and what and you know and what and how are they rectifying it now? You know, are they going to have a program that would prevent the obvious you know sequence of events that occurred with? This or that. Well, nothing. And Cal OSHA is supposed to get that kind of program, require it, and I haven't heard a word. Not a word. Maybe we'll know in February of next year. Maybe we won't, you know. Anyway, uh, I, want, I want to uh, go over something I think that a lot of people don't understand. You know, my field is occupational environmental medicine. And <clears throat> we look at not just the short term effects of exposures, and they were very serious here in Richmond, where you had you know, lots of asthmatic attacks to the point of almost death and the, going to the emergency rooms, but you have irritation. You know, they, I love that word irritate. Well, it's a little irritating. That's, you know, that's not important, you know. It's like, you know, a, few, a little red eyes, a little tearing, or, you know, a little coughing, wheezing. Irritation is a, is a warning, a health warning, that you are absorbing the toxic materials that are being put out. And they go into your systemic system, and in some cases, these are carcinogens, or these are endocrine disruptors, or these are, uh, will affect your immune system, not just, you know, in the next six months, but over the next 10 to 30 years. And let me just go over this real quickly. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I want to know what I'm going to die of. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, let me just go over this quickly, what, what was put out by, uh, by that black smoke, because it's not just an irritant. Uh, they're called polyaromatic poly -aromatic hydrocarbons, poly polycyclic aromatic, P-A-H-A-S, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and this consists of known carcinogens, toluene, benzene, xylene, and then the worst, some of the worst ones are in what's called the particulates. The blackness in the smoke are particulates. And these particulates go down to very tiny, less than 10 microns in diameter. Those go, don't just go into your bronchi, which cause the we wheezing and coughing. They go down into your alveoli and they stay there. There are no, there are no uh, uh, methods for the body or no processing by the body to exclude those. In your, in your bronchi, the major stem bronchi and the bronchioles, there is mucus can be put out and, uh, and ciliary uh, cells that will tend to expel it and you cough up, you know, black sputum. But when you get further down, you've got a permanent dose of these carcinogens that I just talked about, and there are others too. There are heavy metals, mercury, cadmium, lead, beryllium, there are the dioxins, there are nitrogen oxides, the carbon monoxide, oh, God. and there are the acid <laughs> sulfurs that are, that'll scar your lungs, and there's ozone. All of those things can cause permanent damage. So you're, already, you're inhaling that black smoke, which many residents here did, 15,000 that reported. Uh, you've got serious long-term health effects around what I talked about. You have the delayed chronic health effects, uh, Early on, after you get a real irritating dose of, uh, of something that causes an acute asthmatic reaction, we have what we call a, an acute respiratory syndrome. And it happens in your eye mucosa too. You become hypersensitive to other irritants. 
So early when you, you didn't have this hypersensitivity, you might have been getting along fairly well, maybe using an inhaler once or twice a week. But then you become hypersensitive and you start reacting to everything that's a slight irritant. And that's well known in, in occupational medicine with these kinds of exposures. So uh, there's that, the, the, the kind of fairly immediate uh, effects that'll go on for years. But then comes the, the, the increased rates of cancer, reproductive problems, like not just, uh, you know, uh, not just uh, infertility, but also you get problems with uh, developmental disorders, fetal, you know, pregnant women, uh, also you get problems with the ova and the sperm. All of these things can affect uh, re your reproductive uh, data. Endocrine disruption is a big one too. They're finding that in a lot of the chemicals that we talked about here, uh, the aromatic compound, hydrogen compounds, you get uh, effects at very low doses they're discovering. And, and this is work that's been done on pesticides. So at extremely low doses of pesticides, you can have these uh, Hormo, uh, hormone effects called endocrine disruption. And these can have effects on your central nervous system and on all your vital organs, particularly in neonatals. You know, in, in exposures in utero, but also exposures for very young children. So, when, you know, when, when we're talking about setting limits on exposures in the workplace, we're talking about what we call the healthy worker effect. Workers are working because they have passed physical exams and they're in good shape. But when you get into the general population, like here in Richmond, if you're looking at the at-risk population, and who are they? They're pregnant women and their fetuses, the elderly, the very young children, neonatal children, very young children, uh, people who are immunocompromised, uh, people with liver disease, with kidney disease, and people with central nervous system diseases. These are, in other words, these are special populations in the general population that should not be exposed to what, these, what this population was exposed to here in Richmond. And I guess I'll, uh, I'll stop now.